Hello, I'm Cassia, one of the two editors of Channel, and tonight we're celebrating the launch of our second issue. We're so proud of this one, and we want to say thank you so much to all our contributors, and of course especially to those who will be reading their work tonight. This online format may have been forced on us by circumstances, but we're genuinely grateful to be launching this way. An online event allows us to include those readers and contributors living further afield, as well as those who might have had difficulty attending a physical event. So if that's you, we especially hope you enjoy this. These last few months have been an isolation time for most of us. And personally, the level of community and collaboration that's gone into this issue has kept me afloat. Included among the readers tonight will be the four winners and one of the judges of Writing for a Change, a flash fiction competition organised by the Irish Writers Centre in partnership with ourselves and the National Botanic Gardens. We want to give special thanks to all involved in the competition for putting these beautiful pieces of work in our pages and we can't wait for all the partnerships to come as the world opens back up. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to get to share this online launch with you and even more of a pleasure to get to share channel issue two. Um, I know that it has been a long time coming and things do finally feel like they're opening up now that we can share this work with you all. Uh, just before we begin, we wanted to give a brief shout out to our cover artist for issue two, Carol Ann Connolly. Carol Ann is a County Cork based artist whose work primarily explores um, contemporary notions of place and she is just brilliant and she was a joy to work with. Um, she did the cover design as well as provided the artwork that you see on channel issue 2 and um, please be sure to read about her work in the front pages and find her online for more information. Uh, so now we'll just briefly describe what we will be sharing with you this evening. Uh, we asked our contributors to send us videos of themselves reading their poetry and their prose um, from the issue, as well as some uh, poetry and prose that isn't in the issue. And um, so we'll be sharing those readings with you tonight, as well as some photos and videos that our contributors took uh, during lockdown of their localities, uh, which for us was a great joy to see. So we hope that you enjoyed as much as we did. Uh, so without further ado, let's get started. This poem tells the true story of an encounter with starlings at a hotel in Galway City. It's called Songrise. I awake in it, the full on point and counterpoint, chorus so piercing it seems surround sound even through glass. Whistlings squeak high, short pulsed, Glissandi looping and swerving, chucks, tweezlings. The sleeper curled beside me is unperturbed. I go and open the window, let the chill in with the sound swell. Dawn's variant of last twilight chatter mesh, dense and close up as the ivy that harbors it opposite our hotel room. Thrust of sharp, sweet voices, irrepressible underleaf. A tsi tsi tsi, a swing you, a chit chit, as if, I gotta say, a too soon, a ready up, must eat. Hear me, dear day, I'm alive, must sing. Foliage twitches, a starling peeps out dark speckle head with needle beak and then retracts. One perches forth, fans and folds a wing and looks around. One flits up and then another. The ivy quivers, old labyrinth of scurryings at song. More starlings eject, skim overhead and dip back in. Voices upscale, a let's off and not yet. I think sky, dare far, seek sure, now, yes, O oh light. Swift, flur, purr, flush of all up, then silence, 
leaves settle, are still. Out of my sight, a multi-mind, a winged host is mapping the day, filing apart over hospital and garden and estuary. Our room is bland again, my sleeping other breathes deep. What has he dreamt? Hi, I'm Sinead Griffin, and I'd like to thank Cassia and Elizabeth at Channel Magazine for publishing my poem, Earth Sky, Valentine. I point a star blazing west after sunset, white beams that crystallise blueberry skies. Not a star, you say. In fact, that is Venus. Hot and hellish up close, no sign of life. Do I know that Venus spins backwards? and only appears brightest due to the bounce of sun off cloud. Clouds charged with, guess what, sulfuric acid. Imagine, I'd rather not. For once, can we forget about science? Allow Venus, as mother of Cupid, goddess of love, be guide for the sweethearts, the beloved. Hello channel readers, I'm Seth Crook, coming today from a sunny Isle of Mull. Uh, I'm delighted to appear, have a couple of poems in the new edition of the magazine uh, and was delighted to be in the first as well. Uh, my poem in the first was about swimming, which is something I do with great frequency up here, uh, a keen wild swimmer. Um, and. Uh, in fact, only yesterday I was swimming through a channel full of, full of fish uh, offshore with friends. The poems. I've got uh, two poems in the first, in the new edition. Both of them are about, well, the, the not so summary part of life on Mull here, when things are a bit grey in the winter season. The first is called After the Great Gale, the Kingdom of Red. I'm sawing through a fallen willow when, feet away, a robin bobs into view. Our looks don't quite meet, but we meet. It hid from the gale in the tilted shed, a fine idea, and here's another. Stop, pop into the house for an apple, serve the core on this smashed door. Will it notice? The gift is in its beak by the time I've placed the saw to start again. Shed, fruit, no wind. Robin Utopia. Better for a human too, that burst of red through all these broken branches. And this is called Winter. Out with the Kingdom of Red. Out with being an expression used in Scotland. Outside. Winter out with the Kingdom of Red. A day rarely passes without our commentary on the birds. The robin's testimony of colour in a rainscape grown brown. What's waiting by the feeders? As the winter drab settles in, Birdless days seem empty, not like drained mugs or teacups, but unused photograph albums. One morning close to spring, when no seed or nut has moved, one of us will lie about seeing a linnet. Good luck to the editors with the new edition of the magazine. Delighted to be in it. Thank you.
Hello, uh, I'm Rory O'Sullivan. Uh, I have three poems in the magazine. Uh, the first is a short poem called City View. Uh, the second is two sonnets. Um, so I'm going to read them first, City View, and then the two sonnets together. Uh, so uh, here is City View. Uh, City View. Streets like the shoulders of a mountain. Lights nestled into poles that themselves gather light, like trees vying for the sun. Buildings glowing behind the eyes when night falls, then, during the day, all obstinately still and even lifeless. Whoever is looking at a blade of grass or at soil still only looks at them now and again, and otherwise walks over them. Here there are no pedestrians, but heaving clouds of cars. They pass from one horizon to the next innocently, unobserved. Okay. Two sonnets, uh, one and two. And I'll just move straight through them, I won't break them up in between. One. I would like to grow tomatoes with you, and plant a plum tree and, if that should grow, put plums and tomatoes together somehow. We could roast them or make chutney or stew. We could grind them all down into a paste and seal it with yellow and brown spices. We could cut clouds of bread into slices and sit there, taking each thing taste for taste. I know of places where in small, warm sheds they do nothing but paint and brew cider while the dog watches, where the useless heads of chickens bobbing up and down outside are all the traffic they see in a day, and soil sings, Aeolian harp of clay. 2. Sometimes you are like nothing but a vague shape, a byproduct of language. A down deep thought in the bottom of my mind that creeps up past the rim and spills out into me. Sometimes you're like nothing but a feeling in my chest, a twisting feeling deep down, way down at the bottom, that grows around my shoulders and chokes and compresses me. But sometimes you glisten through me like snow and are as real as a plum tree all grown for years all green and with leaves like fists, where every spring the swallows make their nests in a place they know they can return to. In winters out at sea, they think of you. Okay, that's me. Thanks very much. Uh, delighted to be here. Uh, looking forward to uh, seeing everyone do their bits when this is aired, and thanks again. Hello, I'm Karen Izod, and this is my poem, Power of Attorney, Instructions to a Daughter. We're agreed then, at some date when I'm failing to see, or rather have stopped looking, you will take me from myself and set me free. And it might be that beach at Baltos, where the sandalings skit and worry on the tide line, back and forth, back and forth or the cliff further along, where to stand is to keel into an emptiness and be hurled by a Hebridean wind that never drops under my weight. I remember when your own day was coming, I thought to crawl to the edge of a nearby field and set you into the world with my own guiding hand. Some animal urge enveloped me to be alone with you, prolong this solitude of two before that hollowing out that I feel sometimes now, especially now. So I sign the form, trusting to your instinct as well as mine, that to live by one's own hand is never enough, but that this is a way to begin and end. And this one, Meek. Woodman paints his caravan green Brushing away all mention of I saw in this woodland, his wood, his land, his prospect. His track is soft, spore, permanent, padlock, chain, metal gate. Woodman lives on the fringe of his wood, 
deep in his own wood sense, but not deep, more within wood, inhabiting wood. Woodman comes up from the city, brings his axe, his whittling knife, drives along the softening track, leaves his car out of his sight. Woodman wants to feel the world, if not be wild, then in his heart, wants to inherit his earth, wants his wood to dwell, swell within, stain his office white skin, turn it leathery, charcoal burning, crisscrossed deep with moss skin, wants to gather more than a lifetime from the wood, wants to rustle, wants sound that is not sound of motorways or computers pinging, wants a beginning, wants dew, wants sap. Woodman brews his tea, thumbs his briar, inhales, steadies the rush of his desire. And finally, taking turns. You'll get bullfinches in these hedges, he said, about this time of year. They'll come in when the temperature drops. So I keep the hedges thick, leave teasels uncut, the golden rod broken and splayed, an open invitation. I know you will read these signs, how this is not the language of neglect, but your language of survival in the deepest months, when the merest flash of red is a haunting. Be still, watch all these things that were instinct to you and a discipline to me. I wait, sustained in the memory of a pair taking turns with a seed head, politely giving way to each other. Thank you. from Kerry. I'm Liz Quirk and uh, I'm going to read one of the poems that Cassia and Elizabeth have been so kind to publish in this edition of Channel. This poem is called While Waiting for News of Him. I sense snapshots of Galway Bay, breakfasts of fruit and grains, rhododendron and the riverbank at the college called for a flower to obscure background graffiti. I show you the best, most untrue parts of my morning and for a lack of something to say, I say, it's raining here, even though it is not raining. Even though we have had 11 weeks of sunshine and not since 1976 have the farmers been so put upon. You say, It'll probably rain here soon, even though we both know it isn't forecast. But we have managed to pass this conversation like a cigarette, and we will let it burn quietly down until one of us is left with scorched fingers. While waiting for news of him, as though sent directly from your blinking eye, you capture an image from where you sit under a statue of Saint Therese, who I mistake for the blessed and most holy Virgin Mary. You call me a pagan, and how good we are at waiting. You say 
The blessed and most holy Virgin Mary always wears blue. And I say, maybe she wanted a change. Maybe she was disgusted by the pigment and its peaceful associations. Wide blue yonder, blue serenity, blue air and sky, pious, tranquil, never ending calm. Did she never want to scream? Poor most blessed Mary. I consider Saint Therese, the little flower and her brown robe, her shelf outside the ward, but they don't call them wards, do they? When we wait for news of him, you there and me here, it's always the X unit or the Y unit and the saint outside to foreshadow how bad the news will be. Therese and the colour of dirt under fingernails, home and heart and healing, the earth we go back to again and again. And we know, while waiting for news of him, that there will be no healing here, no glory to God in the highest, just to raise and her brown robes and our waiting. Thank you. Hello everyone, thanks for tuning in. My name is Ronan, I'm going to read a short excerpt from my story, Hiatus, about a man who goes on a journey with his dog. Colin took the last exit before Estepona. The road wound back and forth up the mountain, never facing the summit. I don't know where we're going at all, he said. He drummed his fingers on the steering wheel and laughed. The usual chuckle he allowed himself when he admitted things to his dog. They laboured higher. The bends turned in on themselves. He checked the map on his phone. The mountain was called Sierra Bermea. The road was the Carretera Genal Guaquil. It's nice though, isn't it? An adventure with Daddy, he said. Sonny was silent. I mean, fuck it. I'm the only one who ever walked you anyway. Soon there were no other cars. The way ahead straightened. It felt strange for Colin to be in the driving seat. At home, Paula had driven them wherever they went. I'm sorry, he said. For all this, he wiped his forehead with the back of his hand. They said the apartments allowed dogs. Uncle Des, my dad. This was all their idea. Then the security guard and his no se permitting perros. He rested a hand on the box. The road behind was a vague shimmer in the rear view mirror. Mirages appeared and disappeared. I know. I should have checked the rules myself. That's what she'd say. And I know she'd say I'm driving too slowly. Like an old man. Remember that? We used to laugh about it. <laughs> it used to be a joke. Not so funny now, is it? He pressed the accelerator down. He revved the engine as hard as he could. The car began to jolt as it picked up speed. The dashboard and the windows rattled. Sonny barked. Colin slowed down again. Sorry, he said. I don't like going fast either. Sweat pooled at the small of his back. He didn't enjoy this, navigating inland alone. He wished he was on the balcony, sitting in the sea breeze, or in the water, floating with the will of the current. The car overtook him at speed. He shook his head. Sniffled a laugh. What do you reckon the other man is like? The other car had gone. There was no noise from Sonny's box. I bet he's not like me. I bet he's someone who builds things with his hands. He laughed again. The same little nasal disaster laugh. He squinted at the sun. You know that's what her profile said when we met. 
another lot. I'm not joking. It's like she wanted a carpenter or something. Someone who builds things with their hands. You'd think we're living in medieval times. Maybe he's a blacksmith. Or a shipwright. I mean, who actually works with their hands these days? Everyone sits at a desk. She did. I did too. I mean, before we agreed, I'd look after things at home. The sat nav said they were ten minutes away. He patted the box again. Two short taps like a snooker player apologising for a fluked pot. Sorry. I'll stop going on about it. There was a silence as the road descended. Sonny barked. Colin adjusted the pillowcase. Another bark. Silence again. And they drove on into the heat. Thanks. Hello, my name is Hilaire. I'm delighted to have a poem in the new issue of Channel Magazine. Um, and here it is. Pete regarded as cake. Forget Milfoy. Pete holds the Guinness World Record for the most layered layer cake. This cake is slow baked over millennia. It's denser than black bun, malt loaf and Jamaican ginger cake rolled into one. The weirdest sponge cake you'll ever come across. A good squeeze yields a liquid like licorice tea. Pete is Black Forest Ghetto on steroids, and then some. Remember to savour each whiskey-laced crumb, your exclusive taste of the world's only cut and come again in a thousand years cake. And I'd also like to read um, a very short poem from a little booklet I've put together with local artist Stephen Graham, Indoors Looking Out, and it reflects our experiences living um, on the same estate in South London uh, during lockdown. Bird shadows ripple across pavement, car park, out of sight. Up above, skies bear no contrail scars. Birds wheel freely through unclogged air. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michelle Forbes, one of the judges on Writing for a Change. And I have to say, I absolutely adored reading all the pieces for the competition. They were brilliant, every one of them. They were fresh, imaginative, they were unflinching, courageous, passionate. Well done to the winners and to everyone who took part. On the heels of the Writing for a Change tour of the National Botanic Gardens, I had the pleasure of spending some time with the wonderful Brendan Sayers, the glasshouse foreman there and orchid expert, and also with Alexandra Kakamo, the librarian, and Colin Kelleher from the herbarium there. And talking to them helped shape the work I'm currently doing. It's a novel called These Things Are Real, and the protagonist is a botanical artist, and I have a small fragment to read for you now. Frances moves sideways along the hallway and turns into the small study. Spread across her desk are her boxes of watercolours, her brushes, her pencils, her sketchbooks and her precious microscope. She sits down, takes out the sketches she made earlier at the National Herbarium in Glasnevin and lays them out on the table side by side, studies them carefully. The chosen specimen is the tiny bog orchid, one of the rarest of Ireland's wildflowers. It's a beauty. Her sketches record its story. The lateral sepals, the pollinia, the spur, the lips turning to the top of the open flower, the barley sugar twist of the ovary, a specimen as fragile as the paper on which it is drawn. She cracks open her box of paints, dips her brush into a cup of fresh water, strokes it across the dried plugs of colour, then onto the page. In fresh pursuit, she will hone and colour the sketch. She'll highlight the green translucence of the little orchid. Then, when she's happy with her work, 
She'll pencil in a background of sphagnum moss, the bog orchid's natural habitat. She brings green to the page, curves it back, eases ochre into a little burgundy and pink, brings the arrangement to a clean resolution. She lifts her head. She'll paint an orchid like this for Bushra, she thinks, the lovely nurse at the hospital who has been so kind to Antony. The last time she visited, Bushra told her the name means good news, and how appropriate, for it was Bushra who was the one to bring the good news about Antony's recovery. Yes, she'll give a painting of the orchid to Bushra as a thank you gift. She bends her head again to the orchid, takes her time, bringing the wash of colour home, giving what the flower needs to the image of the flower. Thanks to Cassia and to Lizzie for having me on board for Channels issue number two and I wish you all the success with that. And thank you for everyone for allowing me to read all your wonderful pieces. Queenie and the Fawn Loiga La Niam Mishkihon Eg Braca on Lay Mogroch Bioga Ekana Gyantri Mokri Adrum Is Barog Tsil Kriach E K Jal of Nagrena Eg Einen Mokluv Il Dach Galasanda Lon Riem Gamishnul in the Eg Minyad Lum and El Spau Bosch D Eg Paintal on Sperlia in the Egon Sturm Tache Kasulup the An Or Fui Lan Shol Hartin Balurm Ganari de Voherlat, a Yegum dum dillo, we, a tog fjodrenga, shees of a shees, osmacora mock. Ray consun on Gavrig of Fall to Vigera. Fogum slon salunta lemachian cara, on darn yart for shin, a hog fuskadum, o near than gox derm, a rubber in the mina. Kirkum mashota of his bulum on voher, er master o yas. To undurke ignocta o score mahu, toshi luska lagui of his degreen. Mogardian for his book. Bulan and Bulladoche make a train, August Linen Mahula, Lejora. Tagum Kantalum, the Cree Rucha. Fecum Mogardia Galer, Mogardia Allen, Glocha, Scapa, Timpo, and Nua Ifrin Shuk, Gan Bula Erbe in the Shkihan Spadanta. Ton Flora Doche Spalta, the Shantart. Tabron Urum, a Kala Kabukta. Yil Rudderbe Agandiv, Ach Najora, a Ta Oshila, the Magrua. Is Suroch an Ergesh Eid, Och Gallum Gamanic Sheet, Pursula Treta, Lakola Sov, Sheer. Slon Akarja, Gebekig Mesh Erishchiv, in Nail Nusbera Sapauki. Fogum Mavalia Lerskirsta Lon Navron, Avelta. Kamadan and Dokus Mason Air. And Dokus School and Dar and Yartver Ekphonic Derm in Erin. Etzlim or Dolov, Gon Atriver Bit on Bean. Mohim on Kyo or Magrim. Tommy Bugnock Ann. Then I'm so humma, Trin and Scamel Raha, a horn and yad Savalta. Och Neil she am, no and dar. Ta inl be more in Milton at a gawal temple in our arch. Gail in the Mishkihan log. Titum sheas of his sheas. Ton solace a gale when Stashe Gairi Durkanish. Crush and be heel bray Macharje Conadum. Fecking my shiv galiva. Dunum Mahulia of his corn and show he show Suvnach. May er voher master derinach, hus gehidnus nablahas. Suvna shiri da anam a derin in ina shin the varig may, an anog derinach a chanak pert na madina, kabug bing, eg fani gallon lay. Hello, I'm Julie LeBlanc, and I'll be reading my story, Tended. It had taken two weeks to find the wall. She'd nearly missed it, paddling down the great bloated river towards the sea, following the remaining birds. They would know where the last seeds grew. All Hortensia had known was the flood and her life on the island that had once been a mountain. With the sun didn't scorch or the snow burn, the summer storms ruined, and now the fish were fewer and the dark earth gave up less to eat. It must still be there her mother had said. Her eyes had settled on, like coal in Hortensia's heart. But if it's gone? She swallowed and kissed her head. Don't come back. 
Hortensia paddled over submerged paths, following the glint of slanted, skewed capstones below. The names had worn away, while fish darted between generations, startled by her shadow. Ahead, bog cotton grew in clusters like a silent, immovable herd, and the shallows were silent. Once on land, she followed twisting pools as they lapped at toppled stone, trespassed broken gates, and sought out ancient trees, wide and weighted with years of nests, leaves, and the winding arms of briar roses. Beneath the whale's bones, her final landmark, she caught her breath. The metal creaked, crusted with age, still sheltering its living charge. Her hands cupped the laden bunch of small, round spheres, not green only, but shimmering with glimmers of garnet and sepia and yellow. She plucked one, the cluster jiggled like captured breath, and she placed its lone shape in the center of her tongue. For a moment, she held it there. Then her teeth broke the buoyant skin, and a thousand sweetest songs sang out of a hundred afternoons spent not foraging, not surviving, but lying barefaced beneath a gentle sun. Hortensia's hands untangled thin emerald pods and plucked pregnant globes. She filled her satchel with furry yellow suns and pointed coral spears. Firm tankards of red, orange, and green fell into the pooling fabric, and she caught the sweetness on her tongue of nameless green orbs, dripping with golden sugar and bursting with indigo black fruit. Her cheeks, streaked and stiff, blossomed into a smile. If they could grow some of these things, the sweetness faded and she faltered. She clutched at this one hope in the shadow of the setting sun. The birds made way as she picked her path back towards the boat. Thank you. Mr. Garrow's in the car, he big, a good shape, a scale, or drug a joe. Tashili and Dan Mianvasser for her a hoster. Tan Araga Marifach Pan and Linnet on. And she and the tan of a shachty and organ fuss. My ga haviki. Dare he glean a go in Machontanos chair, who shell it. Martin Mimahi and Ekela Donal. Is ta is sig a sail a sig of ahish, go in moorlish. Is she Donald Cameron Achtusha or Draga Dio? Is Tom Midnick Morris son the Kusha? Shing a glorag Balachelehe, Kush Fahlish and Shomer Ranga Regent. Magalora Kine, Tom Midbelt Nahan, a dead and tossal or losig. Will for Molly a goof? Ta. Begshe big opery for Mertine, pierced and draw a clodach gach pede. Stopping on bus as I read me to my hashti. Lean and blah and toil in my room. Tim Shilladonal, toss on in ticker. Toss me to neck in the fadder. Neil Mura and Brusker, a gimmel and ishke. Cup on carch chlor, band the grue glinev. Shulam it so us in the doche. And sonatans gris. Claudini in oja, canny coke. Bodela lu uchter jane. Ni lauren donal an echer. Teresh tamil, see and she, agus bolen and tal of gehedrim in echelish. Cahan me hain shias. Echira, ni a shaggy bril mach, an rudza edering. Fechamidder and da huilage. Katai geshigut. Tan kadriv an an kardus edering rohar eder. Tanto am Kumpal and so in Master of in the Tro. Needum Pali a Krahus Bosch, Spast on Mertogin, Honargotini Yenov. Him Ta Fauna and Rehi Joanishke is a Mala Bruske de Radda la Farraga. Ehoch Nehesh and Plashtoch, Stopach and Dawan. Achkurim Smachdurim Hain. Shasa me shule me joan vion vos. A hira will to kakalor at lay and shame a yig. Ni hoga me tarred. Can the hair of grivent rog, land hogum, a hundolic yonner honel. 
hier nun losgekme. Katachite mache ich hier. Ah, fleck, fleck näher. Na, heide gast ein Gurimscha. Ich hier nobber ist doch die, ihr nicht zu gebrach. Denn im Wachnuf. Hier im Donel, mach spotte Bilge wadwem. Ach, hier im Heiltrüche ist ein Fried, ist ihr in Spede. Ein Piktur Moor. Ist bei dem Richter mit Wolle, kann viele Ehren abbrechen. Hi, my name is Laura and this is my submission to the Flash Fiction um, Writing for Change competition. Like you, as I grew, I began to notice something strange about the world around me. A strangeness that showed itself as grumbling threats to the order of things, like growing up and getting a place of your own, of being able to get a steady job, things that everyone was supposed to be able to do. I know you felt these threats too. I know some of you can't even get enough nutrients from the soil because someone else took more than their fair share. I feel you. I sometimes wonder why people keep saying that things are changing. These changes started long before I took my first breath. Things have already changed. To me, there's two worlds, one imaginary and one real. One that I thought existed, one that maybe used to exist but doesn't anymore. And this world that I'm actually in, that is in danger of giving up. I get it. Sometimes I feel like giving up too. In this new strange world, we're expected to last longer. I know you feel the pressure to bloom earlier because it's warmer. And you're expected to hang on to your leaves longer because it's warmer. It sometimes feels like it's hotting up for me too. Expected to do it all, have a great job and a family, and keep going longer and longer until I'm 66, because I can't afford a pension. There's pressure on me too. It feels like we still have to prove ourselves sometimes, you and me. We have to give this society, this city, this world, everything, just to feel worthy of it, even though it's crumbling, even though it isn't giving us what we need in return. You do so much already just by being. You clean the air we breathe, but that's not enough. We want to eat you, to chop you up and turn you into something more useful, to take the pretty ones inside to look nice, to cut you down and burn you because you're taking up too much space. Maybe you could tell me, if your roots have eyes, how many human heads you can see down there, buried in the sand. Just Jaxa, guarding and you. Uh, my name is Fergus Hogan, and I'm in the garden this morning in Waterford, and I'm really delighted also to have a small little poem in this new edition of Channel. I want to thank Cassia and Elizabeth so much. Um, I've come into the garden today because uh, it's a nature poem, a nature journal. It's just a gorgeous journal, 
and this is the first day that we've had sun in about a month in the sunny southeast. It's the first morning it hasn't rained since they brought in the ban on hose pipes. Um, and this is the first chance I've had to light the summer solstice fire. It's about uh, two weeks, two or three weeks too late or delayed this summer, but it's a strange summer. So I've just uh, put a little piece of mugworth into the fire to the Irish herb um, to give thanks, to give thanks for this little poem. Um, I found this poem in a field in Lithuania, in a small village of Basilione on a beautiful bright morning after a really heavy snowfall the night before, the type of snowfall we just never see here in Ireland. And it's called Foxtrot Shapeshift. After the long dark night of snow, I get up early, walk out into the morning's dawn, sharp bitten, clean cold. I can see clearly all around. I follow a single straight line for miles and miles, footprints etched in time, prayers of a tired old soul set free from a long life. I take the track of single feet. I dream into the underworld. Forgetting how to be myself, I shapeshift into a four-toed fox, slender legs, supple hips, pads for protection against the ice and frost. I trace the story of my life into the melting snow. Over and over again, I kiss the earth light as fur. I leave dark of cold towards light. Thanks. And I might, I think, have time just to read one more small one. And it's taken from my chapbook, uh, Bitter and Cry, that came out last winter uh, from Book Hub Publishing. And this one's called Crow Magic. Now I feed my worries to the crows. Having learned how to live in nature's cycles, I plant my troubles and seeds that I've gathered in warmer times. I place them on branches, cracks and crevices of dead old trees and hidden thin spaces that miss the company of birds and song. A gift from me to them and they come, black feathered, black winged, black beaked. Sharp tongued, they descend in raucous morning and take them all away from me, transmuted my beautiful flock of silver-eyed friends, my funeral of sin eaters. Gormahagiv and have a lovely launch of Channel Volume 2. Thanks all. Sloan. Hi, my name is Orla Martin and I would like to thank Cassia and Elizabeth for publishing my poem. Thank you very much and uh, it's called Hackled. On Suffolk Street, I sense before sight the grey pelt of your coat, carmine plume of scarf. Once worn by chase, now I stand in a pulse of Sunday brunches. Once apex, now dishevelled elegance, squinting against October sunshine on the way to Neary's. On Suffolk Street, under a clock that tells the right time next year, in a sky blue flash of a Dublin bike, you disappear and drag my entrails in your wake. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, uh, my name is David Toms and I am sending this video from a small little place called Dokke in Norway. It's right, it's maybe two and a half hours north of Oslo, right inland. Um, and it's a very beautiful place and it's a great place to be reading these poems from, though I wish I could be with everybody to celebrate the publication of issue two of Channel. Um, I know we've got limited time, so I'm going to make things quick. 
I'm going to just start with uh, two new short poems and then I'm going to read my poem from issue two of the magazine. So the first poem I'm going to read uh, is inspired by some recent uh, events and uh, by some local folklore here from Dhaka. This is called St. John's Eve. Gather and collect, press seven wild flowers to my breast to be placed later beneath a pillow for dreaming and revealing. As flames dance and lick and ash, ash rises on a wind carried in a night from Heleviga to Helvik Head. And the second poem uh, is kind of related uh, poem as well. This is called Home Library. I had no idea you were pressing plants into the pages of books, leaves and markers, walks by rivers and ditches. I've left my marks too. Flour caking pages where the box tea is, flora and food. Recipe as prescription, our medicine written up as gift, bread and roses. Uh, and now I'm going to read the poem which uh, appears in the new issue of Channel. Uh, this is a poem called Autumn. Autumn. Banjo clang the strain of song mounting. Bird bashes its beak against the bark. Order the rain first, the idea after. Counting first the days, then the hours. Encountering first the face, then the flowers. The dog lies flat. On the decking, sad reacts only, the death of Marat. Osobuco, sourdough bread, recipe for love. Shocked oysters, Bible tripe, a new leaf. Drift water, wash minus tide, rockaway beach. Autumn shiver, short evening skitter. Placed mats, neats, tongue, shaved membrane, thinly sliced portions. All flowers wilt, all follow with flowers. Crackling, too black for the Holy Ghost. The gap between tail and teller bridged. Birchwood burning, flames firm as ferns. Redoubtable, the reassurance of the horoscope. I dreamt I was a sparrow wrangler. There you go. That's it for me. Uh, thanks very much indeed uh, for having me as part of this uh, online launch. And I'm looking forward to hopefully celebrating future issues of Channel uh, in person with everybody. So uh, have a good night. Great. Cool. Warm greetings from the coast of Maine, USA. My name is Mark Swan. First off, I'd like to thank the channel team for supporting my work, publishing a poem in Issue 1 and Issue 2. I'm going to read the poem from Issue 2, End of the Season. Leaves have fallen, no snow yet, but predicted later today. Wind picks up as I walk down the rutted road to the bay. In a small dirt lot, a white Volvo station wagon, an older couple wrapped up in conversation. They don't look my way as I pass by. On the rear bumper and window, create the world you want to live in. Give peace a chance. Ahead of me, a shell fisherman knee-deep in muck, waders caked with brown ooze, pulling a small water sled with a basket of clams. I remember those days in high rubber boots out of the kayak in Barnstable Harbor, Low tides, small islands jutting up, raking through slick humps for little necks, steamers. I start my half-mile trek home, passing the Volvo. They are quiet now, like the decision has been made. I think of a piece in the Press Herald, a couple up the coast, 75, 77, on their bed, hands held, watching waves ebb and flow, waiting for the bourbon and barbiturates to kick in. I hope the launch is a grand success. I wish you all best wishes and be safe, stay healthy in this rather complex, tumultuous times in which we live. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Katrina Schein and I'm going to read an extract from a short story called Alcus Urbis. It's set here in Oslo where I live and partly set here in the palace grounds. I'm going to read from the opening. Uh, one morning in early June, five regional Norwegian newspapers held in their pages more or less the same story. None of these stories merited the first page, so it was a while before anyone saw the link. Each reported an elk who had wandered right into the centre of a large town. With midsummer approaching, it was hard to sleep, but I did not hear a sound outside that night, or not enough to draw me to my bedroom window. At that time of year, even in Oslo where I lived, night was a thin cloud through which you could always glimpse day, and I remember finding it hard to believe those elks got lost. My mother was on her way home from night shift at the hospital when she saw the first elk, perhaps the bravest of them all, the one who came to the centre of Oslo alone and without precedent. Its hooves clanked along the tram tracks until it stopped and swayed its head towards the shop window. My mother called the police and guarded the elk until they came. She had seen elks before while skiing in the forests and she knew to keep a distance. She knew a kick from a leg as long as herself could be fatal. She told my brother and me that it was not unusual for yearlings to wander bewildered into suburban gardens. The cows shooed away the previous year's calves as the time for a new birth approached. But this was no suburban garden, and this was no yearling. This was a cow by herself, and she lacked the bulge on her grey-brown flanks that would have suggested a calf on the way. That morning, my mother watched as the police cordoned off the street and shot the cow. Her body gave the ground one hard pound. Blood was hosed in a strawberry stream down the nearest drain. All this happened before the morning spilled its crowds onto the streets, so no one noticed. Still, my mother and I both found it astounding that there was so little talk about it that day. When I told my friends in college, they said, No way, are you serious? And that was all. When my mother told the neighbour, his only reply was to tell her at length of his own encounter with an elk in the forest some years before. A few days passed before the next movement of elks. At least I found no other articles about them in the archives for that period. Of course, I can't be sure of the elk's movements within the forests. For all I know, they may have been moving in uncharacteristic patterns for quite some time, all hidden in the forest green. In the commercially forested southern tip of Norway, a family of elks came into the city of Kristiansand. The cow, ox and calf were found strolling down Markens, the main pedestrian street, as morning honeyed the nocturnal glow. The local newspaper, Fatherland's Friend, caught and printed an image of this unusual family outing, as the headline read. The photograph found its way to the front page on this occasion. It showed the elks clustered at angles to each other in the middle of the otherwise empty streets. I'll leave it at that. Thank you.
the brink. There is a hushing that happens in that second before the sun sighs. A girl of 16, blushing, her toes in the sand, hand skimming the sea. Maybe by the blues, a boy tracing his finger over his own neck, wishing it were smooth. A lady contemplating her lies, reminded by cumulus hues. Or a man and his father, shoulder to shoulder, sharing a riddle. Somewhere far, a forest fire, toning its hazy rush in oranges, greens, and more. The end of a street, the 44th floor, pigeons on a wire, everything with a middle, watching the sky melt. Hi, my name is Sarah Alcade Eskew, and I'm going to be reading a few poems. The first one is called Ode to the Kingfisher. Dear God of Wind, dear Morning Star, give me a glimpse of your cobalt crown, your persimmon throat. Pluck me from my mud bank and carry me home in your mouth. Dislodge my bones and fashion them into flutes. Cling to me like the earth clings to your tangled roots. Tunnel me through termitariums each evening and swallow me like soft wood so I can live inside your chest, if only briefly. I will unhinge for you like a water-weakened shell. I will rid myself of running like the hunted hare pinned to an open field. Only then will I know each stone unturned, each seed unearthed. Only then will I be able to fly. This next one is called Broken Villanelle with Bees. Um, obviously, it's not a proper villanelle, but the villanelle form inspired it, so. I trace my own dendrochronology, map my growth with ring wrists. My body is a betrayal, an immaculate antilogy of monarchs, burgeoning fault lines, risks I can't resist. In glass jars, I carry my apologies, sometimes pin them to the clothesline. Still in spring, roots untwist, and I admire the season's brevity, how bees comb my spine for honey and skin unkissed. Tulip loud they tease me, wrap me with thread and twine in the garden, our chambered tryst. As figs, as bruises on knees, our bodies velvet ripening, entombed in all we missed the tidal swell of seas, the prayers prayed to trees. And the last one is from my new chapbook called Bruised Gospel, and this poem is called Migrant Speech. Tilt of summer, face full of flies, my mind unwinds, sheds as a serpent. My illness can't be held, can't bleed, but rather ripens, rots like speech. Now the wind, now shadow play on pavement. I want to name for everything. Why? My tongue unhinges, pries from the dry throats of strangers sound. I mispronounce my name, those simple syllables, but still reassemble this body each morning. Perhaps I am stronger than the ground I was cut from. Thank you. You've the face of someone who could do with looking at sea, he said, stinging your eyes and giving them salty crinkles, so that even a few hours later you're still squinting. Maybe you won't even submerge yourself in the water, and that's okay too. Okay to just feel sand under your skin, dry and soft, wet and deep. To breathe in a different type of wind and let it throw you forward to that great expanse, close enough to taste the spray. Now, he said, walk for miles until you forget that you're walking. Until you forget that you have hips and knees and feet that are steering you along. 
And when you do realise, pound and patter and slap and dig, your big toe burying in and collecting grit under its nail. And the sea will leave patterns on the sand for you then, lines and branches and trees so many that they make a forest for you to walk through, patterns forged for under your feet. And this is a different type of stillness to your Loch Derg. It's loud, but background loud. Close your eyes in spring, summer, autumn, winter, and the swoosh of it reaching the shore is always the same. It lets you have your thoughts, but it lightens them. It nudges them forward rather than pushing them further down. In calm or in chaos, it lulls you into peace rather than plunging you into steady, same, unmoving darkness. Describe the sea for me, he said, now that you've finally seen it at the grand old age of 23. Pretend I'm not here, come on. I've read your notebooks, I know you're full of shite. And I wanted to say, I bubble in pockets around bodies when they swim through me. I look fizzy sometimes, but I sound different to the hiss of a can or the dull sparkle of your favourite mineral. Do I crackle? Do I suds? Can suds sound? Gather lather suds on sand, the circular noise of it, a washing machine, a lathered sponge on skin. He watched me thinking, still not answering him. Look out at it, he said. Then he took my hand in his and guided it towards my face. Do that trick where you rest your hand on the bridge of your nose so you can't see what's underneath anymore, only what's on top. What's underneath it? You gone, me gone. And what's on top of it? Moments of blended blue, loud and quiet and still and moving for you. We stood like a pair of madmen together then, the taste of the spray and our own shite talk on our lips, hands across our noses, staring at the sea blue and the sky blue and the line at which they meet and the line at which they blend, infinite and constant. He said the sea should be there to keep me mad when I told him it kept me sane. He said my word and tongue rhythms felt rough, but in the most beautiful of ways. He said listen always to the silence, to the beat swim waltz of your chest, blood and brain. He said inhabit yourself fully and you will never know silence again. He said this like it was good, good, the best thing. Echolalia, repeat after me. He said, he said, he said, he said. Everything I am, he said. Thirst. Soft mud to sink feet in, something wanting, girl born under the sea, flapping in the breakers. Is this what you call home, bodies of water? I bleed for you more than once a month. Dirty river boardwalks, have you tasted thee? Nothing compares to unskilled palate, ruined by too much salt, loved one with a sweet tooth, long gone but eating for island memories, combing beaches for chemically weathered glass, and things are never. Synthesis. She is made of foam, spinning, Barren thread between her teeth, my spit glued to her ties. I will keep you safe inside. My fingers are too soft, plucking at her flesh. Disentangling this mess escapes me. I am illiterate. I am dumb. Do not fathom her meanings. Arsenic, ply her with drink. Give her a needle. Swallow this. I listen carefully, but do not follow. There is a flood, she goes, head first into the sea. I am made of foam, she said. I am spinning barren tread between my teeth. No fruits will fall from me. Orchard Diary of Our Undoing 
At year's turn, a haze occludes the dawn, plum branches jig in the wind. On first quick view, I think I glimpse a blue fox. From the snow willow coppice, meltwater rivulets juggle and nudge exact passages down our mossy bank. Jays give way to falling cherry blossom. Birds interrupt in exuberant songs to pluck dog hairs we pegged out with the wash. Spring veers into summer. A few of us worry about the lack of wasps in back garden jam traps. We leave the grass and moan for shrews and bees. You find self heal Napweed and Veronica springing from the earthen seed bank. It is very dry. I fritter away weeks writing a book about chance and the horse. Perhaps you fail to notice the slippage. Halloween night, with candles in hollowed out turnips. Beefeast on nuts and brack, you bite the ring. Pulling willow baskets on wheels, we walk to the shops, walk to the station. This is farewell, the day falls away, away. Alone here after you left, I look at our last kept apple shining on the shelf beside a leaf. I bite the red apple, one puny fling at pleasure. Trapped in this frail hall, peering out, teeth rattling against the glass, I got your letter. A lone thrush sings, spring again, frost dissipating fast. The fine dog hairs I pegged on the line this season are sodden. It rains and rains, a rain dawn letter. I plant roses in the garden, hand paint pollen, one apple tree to another apple tree. She on a tall ladder sees no pollinators. He on another ladder sees no pollinators. I hasten to tell this loss. Do the people listen? Listen, he is alone in his loss. I too in loss alone. See it slip, people? It slips. No, no. No one hastens, alas. Soon to see no people, no one to taste apples. All at last, not apples. No last post. Noon plots on, on. Shot noon, on, one, on. Pollen elopes to no plot, no slope, no pole. Lost, no, not to stop loss, not to stop. Stop, stop, no, not stop, stop, no, no. On so to O. Oh. So, no sons, oh no, oh. This is Richard W. Halpern. I'm recording this in my Paris flat because I can't be with you for the launch of Channel. I'll read the poem that the Channel editors took. I do not know this man. Once more I find solace in the poems of Edward Thomas. I do not know why. I know nothing of nature. I love the sea, which he seldom mentions. I have never walked a field in my life. He is one with fields, with owls and cuckoos, with brooks and dead ends, with mornings in England, Wales, and France, if there is a difference and there is a difference, a sweetness, a sadness, a familiarity of observation, a panic, and a pull which has nothing urban in it. I do not know this man, yet this night he sets me right again, whatever I am. 
If there's time, I'll read a second poem. Before that, I want to mention that my poetry is published by Salmon Cliffs of Moher and Lapwing, Belfast. And I don't ask that you buy my books, but I do ask that you please consider looking at their lists because they have very good lists. Here's the second poem. The sea is immense and honorable. I misread a line in a poem as the sea is immense and honorable. To misread and to read are no different from one another. In the space between, a glimpse of glory. Our race has often disgraced the sea. Homer doesn't. My mother, splashing about in it as a small child in Bangor, honored it. The salt of it entered her, and so entered me. Two ladies immense and honorable, my mother and the sea. The sea may object to being called a lady. Be careful here, say the drowned. But this is my poem, and so, lady, she is. Pigeon stood framed in the doorway by the light of the hall beyond, shifting excitedly from one foot to the other. He'd lost his pyjama top of the night, wriggled out of it to escape the heat in the middle of winter in Ireland. Today he was allowed to wake them up. Today was his once-in-a-lifetime day. A hairy foot stretched out from under the end of the duvet. Pigeon giggled. Then John's head popped up beside his mum's and smiled broadly at him. John! It's my lucky day, he squealed. Yes, buddy, it is. And where are we all off to? To look for America, Pigeon lilted off key. Well, maybe not quite that far, but I know what you mean. 624. Coffee in the flask. Jam sandwiches wrapped. Crusts off for mum. Tinfoil. Crusts on for Pidge. Paper bag. Digestives. Dark chocolate for John. Map. Open at the right page. Trip counter to zero. Put your seatbelt on, P. Click. Lights on. John eased the car carefully out of the drive, though the chances of anyone being on the road were, as Pidge would have happily pointed out, twinchy. Sinead rubbed the condensation from the window so she could see them as they headed off. Soft pools of light from unseen fittings meandered back into the trees. John and P stopped in the first bright spot and turned, waving theatrically. She remembered how she used to wipe the bus window to wave at John on winter evenings when he got off three stops before her. How he'd walk backwards, smiling his big goofy grin at her until the bus pulled away. She waved back. Their silhouettes appeared and disappeared, smaller each time, but always undeniably them. P, lean and bony, head tilted, shoulders tight, elbows tucked, fingers pointing at who knew what. John like a giant beside him, his big soft face turned to P, his lumpy frame blue to P's Mowgli. She wondered which of them was harder to love. They stepped out of the last pool of light were gone. Sinead took Pigeon carefully into the back seat, put his seat belt on, pulled his hood up. He was drifting in and out of sleep. Every time he woke he mumbled, once in a lifetime. I know, Ben. John turned the key, gripped the gear stick, pushed it into first, flicked on the wipers and watched them sweep the dew from the windscreen. He leaned on the accelerator, eased off the clutch, felt the engine pull. He gripped the handbrake, its worn leatherette against his palm, pulled up slightly to release the button, then eased it down. His seat pushed gently into his back. The gravel grumbled under the wheels. Pidge's breath caught in his nose, whistling slightly. The gravel gave way to tar, the grumble now a soft hiss. The hedges on either side were heavy with beads of moisture, their shined leaves reflecting the grey sky. As the car gathered speed, the countryside opened out in front of them snaking line in the centre of the road drawing them on, back to their lives. Through a small break in the clouds, the sun appeared, flooding the car with light. John felt warm tears fall softly down his cheeks. You know you'll still get to see him. Sinead reached across and rested her hand on his where it was on the gear stick. He felt the muscles in his forearm tighten involuntarily, but he didn't try to take his hand away. In the back, Pidge woke. I see the light, I see the light. Yes, Pidge. There it is.
between. I find hairs molt beneath the holly, where other trees bear their death angles quietly, holly shuns with wide awake thorns. The hair, she leaves parts of herself everywhere, winter's soft white blanket, she births, spring, summer, then witch. She already burns, a shocking heat tucked away, redness in the pit of her like a bite. Fur is ruined smoking. Her paws are cold starfire. At dawn she learns to box without gloves. Cleft-lipped witch shafts herself, leaping broom. In the slick of morning sheds her old body, licks it off, tongue clogged with all the demands made of it. I know the woman that walks out of the wood in the evening. She is the one the wren inflates with song for. The fox leaves his gifts on the path for her. Acorns split to show her their red inner meat. Her lips are still velvet. Dear, is this the usual place? The sun lurches down before purples name the night. Is this where you come, dear? Beside the train tracks, where the trees stab new green hard, linger here, where your death is only a wraith. Train rumbles shock through your hooves. I first kissed a boy in my bedroom. Then on the train tracks, the space between one another, thin as a run over penny. I know that sudden jerk from one track to another, the neck breaking angle and floundering eye. I get you, dear, that nearly ran into my bike. I too yanked myself over in a new direction to avoid grief. They shot a wolf in the next village. My heart is made river, made sea. It has suffered this ferocious hot summer like the pack has. The water level is so low, but it can still churn, still whirl and weep. We look forward to a pall of snow to remake the wolves. In its slip toward grey, we look forward to blood pumping like a storm, like a frenzy. Now, though, we must make do with insubstantial mist and the icy grey gleam of flint in sand. Let our imagination howl at the dark moon and her mercy. We bring birch into our home, build our beds with its irregular silver flanks, grow wild roses and honeysuckle to flower in spring, entice the wolves in with fresh meat. Their cubs will sprout from the, beneath our mattresses, tumble from our rumpled blankets, and repopulate the sterile wood with wildness and round the moon with howls. And that's everyone. Thank you so much to the readers. We hope you've enjoyed Totem Pass. And to everyone watching, we hope you've enjoyed the launch too. We'd of course be delighted if you'd buy the issue. There'll be a purchase link for our website available in the description of this video. But we'd also be really grateful if you'd consider buying from one of our statists. That's Books Upstairs, The Company of Books, The National Botanic Gardens, The Library Project and The Winding Stair here in Dublin, Soma Coffee Company and West Cork Arts Centre in County Cork, and our newest statist for issue two. Banny Bucks in County Clare. Hi everyone, thanks again for joining us. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed that as much as we did. And um, as Cassia mentioned, please do be sure to visit our website to get yourself a copy of Channel Issue 2 or to visit one of our stockists. Um, we also, I believe, have some copies of Channel Issue 1 still available for purchase, um, both internationally and uh, within Ireland. So if you wanna start yourself up a bundle, get the whole channel situation situated, 
I would recommend it. Uh, as well on our website, you'll find some information regarding submissions for issue three, which will remain open through the end of the month until the 31st of July. Uh, we are currently accepting and reviewing submissions across uh, poetry, prose, and artwork. So um, if you have some work that you'd like to share with our readers, please do send it our way. And in the meantime, um, enjoy the rest of your day and enjoy your weekend. And um, happy summer to everyone.